Do you know who's behind your email? What do they fund? Are they building a culture you want to be a part of? This Advent, break up with big tech and reboot your email with FIDE. Look us up, F-I-D-E-I. And there's a link in the description box below. That's FIDE, how Catholics send email. Once in a while, we get a look into a parallel universe where the laws of reality are completely different than they are for those of us who live in the real world. Typically, we get a look into this parallel universe whenever a secular academic starts publicly opining about social and political issues that they actually know nothing meaningful about, while pretending to care about the plight of all of us normal plebs, when in reality, they, again, know nothing about normal people. <laughs> Today, I have the dubious pleasure of bringing to you the ravings of a theologian who is clearly out of touch with reality because he can't define reality. He's a practitioner of something called cultural contextual theology, which makes the basic claim that theology is best understood relativistically in the context of different cultures. It's a fancy way of saying the truths of the faith will mean something different in different cultures, meaning the truth becomes relative. This theologian invokes Francis's motu proprio that was issued in October of this year, calling for greater relativism in the study of theology. It truly is a peek into a parallel universe, one which these theologians desperately want to impose on those of us living in the real world. Headline from where else but America Magazine, Pope Francis has challenged theologians, but are we bold enough to respond? All right, though, so the author here gives us this hot take. He's a theology professor at a Jesuit school, because of course he is. He specializes in something that just smells of modern, rotten academia, culturally contextual theology. And what does that mean? One generically Christian website described culturally contextual theology in this way, quote, Contextual theology uses principles from the Bible, but filters it through the lens of contemporary reference points. Forming such a theological system, one must consider linguistic, sociopolitical, cultural, and ideological factors. The result is sometimes a syncretic hodgepodge of beliefs. Following Jesus in one culture and context may look very different from following Jesus in another culture on the other side of the world, and it may look nothing like Christianity at all. Obviously, contextual theology has to be applied carefully. There is always a danger that in accommodating the truth to a culture, the truth is compromised and the gospel is lost in translation. <laughs> End quote. In other words, it's a form of relativism. The demands of the faith are going to be different from one culture to another. Not obvious, or not in ways that are obvious or over the top necessarily. You won't find anything as obvious as it suddenly being okay to engage in activities suitable to the married state outside of the actual bonds of holy matrimony because you travel from one country to another. Although that may be true if you travel from one diocese to another, but that's another story. But it's nothing that obvious, really. You, what you'll find are disagreements over what the faith entails in very fundamental ways by adopting this broken theology. So... Back to the America article here, quote, The expression, music to my ears, sounds like a cliché, but that is how is Pope Francis's recent apostolic letter on the nature and mission of theology, ad theologium provendum, sounded to me. Serving as I do in a Jesuit Catholic school of theology that prides itself as an international center for the study of culturally contextual theology, it seems our strategic option to go Contextual predates by several years the Pope's resounding summons to undertake, quote, a paradigm shift and a, quote, courageous cultural revolution toward, quote, being a fundamentally contextual theology. But this is not the time to gloat. In his motu proprio, Francis calls for a tripartite turning that is geographical, social, and cultural. On the face of it, there is nothing new here. The public and Christian intellectual tradition has taken critical turns at key historical junctures resulting in fresh thinking, new insights, and transformational endeavors. If I am reading the Pope's letter correctly, a geographical turn points theologians in the direction of a tumultuous world roiled by all manner of dysfunctionality. A social turn addresses existential realities that besiege humanity, and a cultural turn grapples with the shifting matrix of meaning for individuals and their societies in uncertain times. As Pope Francis sees it, all of these require a new hermeneutical and methodological framework 
that is not averse to confronting the complexities, fragilities, and vulnerabilities of our times. In my view, Francis does not intend to demoralize theologians or undermine centuries of theological production. He simply reminds us not to lose sight of the stuff of which and, quote, outgoing theology is made in an outgoing church. See at Theologian Preventum number three. Given this, Pope Francis's letter reads like a roadmap for, quote, doing theology as if people mattered, to quote the title of an edited volume by Deborah Ross and Ed Eduardo Fernandez. It, that volume, recalls the Pope's all too familiar of factory imagery that if theologians do not, quote, smell of the joys and hopes of the pain and anguish of the people of their times and contexts, they become tabletop speculators in arcane complexities and purveyors of theological inanities. End quote. Let me know if you actually understood anything he said there. But there's one thing Francis says about all of this that the theologian repeats that is actually pretty correct. At the most basic level, all too many lay theologians are completely out of touch with reality. All too many of them refuse to understand or communicate the faith in terms that the typical person can understand. See that quote I just read to you. And many of them refuse to engage with the most pressing issues of our time. We live in a time when the faithful clearly want a coherent faith taught to them. One that offers clear moral guidance in a world that's just gone off the rails. We see the outside world not only rejecting Catholic morality, we see it mocking Catholic morality and offering an alternative that does not correspond to reality. This is happening at a time when the liturgy of the church is under a sustained attack and few theologians in the church seem to care enough about these things to address them. Choosing instead to focus on navel-gazing or issues of making the church more democratic by inventing grounds for revolution in some ancient text that if you read it with revolution in mind, you can find the justification for just about anything you want to impose on the church in those documents. Case in point, one that, may, that a lot of people don't like when you bring it up. We saw this with communion in the hand. Often one text from one church father is cited for that practice, when in reality, you can very easily find the rest of the fathers of the church in his own day contradicting that one statement the modernists loved so much. Communion in the hand was not the widespread practice we're told it was by the Bergolians in the church. And the theologian in this article gives the game away with his invoking of liberation theology as the guidestone. Liberation theology had been all but condemned by Ratzinger and John Paul II in the 1980s and 1990s, but now it is the ruling ideology in the church. Liberation theology takes a classic language of being freed from sin and vice that our Lord offers us and turns that language into being free from materialistic political constraints. The language of oppression is in all this stuff. We see secular language used throughout the writings of liberation theologians, including by Francis in his encyclicals. And this theologian is more than happy to invoke that radical theology that stands in opposition to Catholicism to make his case. Quote, an interesting feature of a culturally contextualized theology is its dialogical and relational character at multiple levels. How and where we do theology is not detached from the communities and context of this exercise. Years ago, I wrote in Theology Brewed in an African Pot that theology isn't an exercise in conceptual weightlessness. It does not defy the law of gravity. It is grounded in lived reality. Francis shares this view, it seems. Our writing, scholarship, and teaching must be possessed of a deep desire to bring some coherence to the chaos and crises prevalent in our world today. Like, then he goes on and ver lists various social and allegedly scientific programs that Fro Francis focuses on instead of the faith that he can't criticize on this platform. But this isn't new teaching. The methodology of liberation theology is living testimony to the task of theology as reflection and praxis that begins the propositions of the gospel into dialogue with the present, engaging in critiquing cultures, contexts, and traditions that fail to uphold the dignity of people and foster their flourishing as imago Dei. Seen in this light, theology isn't an isolated, self-absorbed discipline. Theological engagement bridges disciplinary boundaries and collapses silos to create an unbounded sphere. In this space, theology takes its place, not as a medieval queen of the sciences, but as a partner in a web of disciplinary relationships, communities, and networks, animated by a singular goal of transforming the conditions in which men and women live daily in different geographical, social, and cultural environments, see Ad Theologium Prevendum number four, 
Francis christens this approach as, quote, multidisciplinarity, suggesting that the theological enterprise is akin to a team sport where the essential qualities of cooperation, collaboration, and commitment are complemented by synodal dispositions of encounter, listening, dialogue, and discernment, end quote. Remember, Francis wants theology to be taken seriously by the social sciences, which is never going to happen. And here it's reduced to just another one of those worthless social sciences. And I say that as a social scientist. Truly the most lost and frankly dumbest people I've ever met in my life were social scientists with PhDs. If I can earn a PhD, then the degree isn't that special, to be honest with you. People who believe in the weirdest, most out of touch with reality ideas you will ever encounter all typically have PhDs. They honestly think they have some special insights into the problems facing the world when in reality... They often know a lot less than you or I do about the problems in the world. And now this thinking is being attached to the theology of the church, hence the really weird focus on scientific issues and socio-political issues instead of the most basic question of all, the salvation of souls. Who will be saved? And how can the church help save the most souls possible? That's the question theology should be tasked with, and has been traditionally. He took, a, he took a couple of uh, cheap shots there at Thomas Aquinas, by the way. But we're not in this business anymore, not in this new springtime in the church. And the fact is that theologians like this are part of the problem, fueled by the errors of Francis. What do you think? Did you notice that his quotes were all academic gibberish? It's not an accident. I understood what he was saying because I used to be knee-deep in that world, but the things he spent a lot of time communicating could have been said in plain language, in a sentence or two, and not lost anything in the process. That, my friends, is part of the problem. Those who speak in credentialism and who believe in credentialism speak another language while lecturing us about dialogue and accompaniment. It's all really so tiresome. But I'm curious what you think, so let me know what you think of all this in the comments, please. And yes, hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So to share this on social media, that helps too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.